Hi, and welcome to this lecture on environmental adaptation of animals. This is the last video on transport of solutes and water. I am now concentrating on active transport and osmosis. And this is also the last video of the first part that already is something that you should already know something. So let's start with stomach. The stomach can be stored, be storing food, but it's also important for killing the pathogens. And it also uh, starts cleaving the proteins, so there's a pepsin that is working well in acid. Uh, uh, <coughs> Hi, and welcome to this lecture on environmental adaptation of animals. This is the second part of transport of solutes and water, and now considering on active transport and osmosis. And this is the last video also for the first week that consider something that you should already be quite familiar with. Let's start with the stomach. The gastric juice is very acid. And so the stomach is not only used for storing the food, but it's very acid, so it kills the pathogens. And in this acid environment, there is an uh, enzyme called pepsin that cleaves the proteins to amino acids and small peptides. And this gastric juice is secreted by some cells and inside the cell the pH must be around 7 and then in the gastric juice it's about 0 0.8. So there's a, about 2 million fold concentration gradient and it's doing this, it must be done by active transportation because if you have a channel for proteins it would definitely go in, in the opposite direction. And it's actually made with iron pump. So there is a pump that is moving protons out from the cell and at the same time moving sodium inside the cell. And all this is done by using ATP energy. And because it's changing two plus uh, charges to two plus charges, then it's electroneutral. So there is a no net charge moved. But you can understand that, okay, if every time when it's moving or turning, it will use one ATP. So it's it's quite energy demanding process. And this is just one good example of active ion transportation, where the energy is used to move the particles in higher electrochemical potential. And beside this, we also have kind of secondary active transport. So we can link the movement of some other uh, some particles on the electrochemical potential of sodium or uh, potassium or chloride, etc. So we can use the exchangers or co-transporters to move together something. But even they they are kind of, of uh, they are called called a secondary active transport because they work only because we have these ion pumps also. So what kind of ion transporters and pumps we have? We ha in the previous video I was describing that okay what kind of channels we have and now we also have then these co-transporters or exchangers or whatever and then the pumps that are using directly the ATP. And if we look from the databases, these are all the ion transporters in mouse. And over there are some that are uh, transporting more than one ion. Sodium and chloride can be transported together, or sodium and proton, or sodium potassium chloride, sodium potassium, chloride some onions, etc. So we have co-transporters that are using usually sodium or chloride gradient. And then we have uniporters, usually these channels, and they are mainly transporting potassium, calcium, chloride, sodium, 
But then there are also water channels, metal channels, onion channels, etc. And then, what about these pumps? What are they doing? Well, they can pump pretty much different things. Uh, in the previous slide, we have already this type 2C. So, potassium was pumped and the proton was pumped. And in this same type, there is also sodium, potassium, ATPase. But also, you can, you can see that, okay, we have also pumps that are working, that are pump, pumping only one ion, like calcium or potassium. Uh, there is also for very uh, specific uh, ions like zinc, etc. But then also, for example, type 4, that is transporting phospholipids. And these ion pumps are the workholes to maintain the concentration gradient. And this was actually found by Ernst Overston in 1902, just by speculation. That, okay, he was calculating how many times in the lifetime the he heart, heart is beating. And because it was known that, okay, there is a, a sodium is fluxing and potassium is fluxing during that. So it should, uh, all these electrochemical gradients should be lost during our life, but it's not lost. And he found that, okay, there must be some mechanism to maintain it. And the mechanism is sodium potassium ATPase. So there is a ATP used every time this pump is working and it's transporting three sodium and two potassium and because there is three versus two now it's transporting one charge more so that's why it's also uh, it's electrogenic so it's affecting on the membrane potential and this can be, then be used for maintaining the sodium and potassium gradients and what else we have there we have some onions uh, uh, some proteins that are usually have negative charge and they are trapped inside the cell so they are affecting a little bit on the membrane potential but then we have sodium and potassium that are trying to reach the equilibrium by the flux through the ion channels and so they are the major uh, source that is affecting on the membrane potential Okay, how then this sodium potassium pump works? Well, we have a pump that is not poor because otherwise if there would be a hole in the membrane then we would lose the sodium and potassium electrochemical gradient. It will start by, there is a catalytic site that is trying to bind sodium. And when the sodium is occupied there is a catalytic site for for ATP so the ATP is hydrolyzed and that affects uh, conformational chains in in this this uh, transporter and then these ions are trapped inside this this molecule and the energy that is, is got, uh, get from from the from the uh, ATP, it it drives the opening of the extracellular side of this this pump. And at the same time, when okay, then the sodium can leave, and the potassium can occupy these same sites. And at this, this time, okay, this will affect that, okay, the second ATP will bind and this will affect that, okay, then the potassium can, uh, it, the conformation is changed and then the potassium can unbind or leave the protein inside the cell. And it's pretty fast, actually. It, it, it can make this 
all these tricks with uh, four times, 400 times per second or something like that. But it's still quite slow because if we have a potassium channel, there are some uh, 100 million ions per second that can flow. And actually, because it's every time it works, it uses ATP, so it's enormous amount of energy that is needed. So, in, for example, in brains, almost 80% of the ATP cons uh, consumption is used for this sodium uh, potassium ATPase. So this activity is large also in, in other organs. So the, it's it's a very uh, huge problem if the so, uh, iron gradients are lost. And that's why it has to work all the time. And it can be easily measured. We can just check that, okay, how much ATP is consumed and then use the specific pump plugger. And uh, in the uh, semi-hibernating Crucian carp uh, that we were collecting ages ago, yeah, and and at the same time recording that okay, how many, how much there was water, uh, or how how much there was oxygen, and what was the temperature, etc. So you you have seen these uh, these animals also already prior. So actually, you can see that at the same time the oxygen concentration is lower. Also, the sodium potassium ATPase activity is much lower. But actually, this is not uh, caused by the limiting the number of pumps. But actually, because the temperature gets lower, so the pumps are working much slower. And that causes that, okay, they will save the energy. So, the sodium pump is a workhorse for solute transporter. So, in a typical cell, we, the glucose concentration is quite much the same as in the blood. But still, when we are having, uh, drinking a Coke, etc. So, the uh, lumen glucose concentration can be very high or quite low. So, it had to be, we have to have a mechanism to get all the glucose out from our intestine to uh, the circulation. And this is made, done by using the sodium gradient. And it can't work if we don't have the epithelia with tight function and separate basal and apical membranes. So, in the other, other side of the, of the epithelia, we have sodium potassium ATPase and it's pumping sodium out from the cell and this affects that okay if we have in the lumen sodium it's trying to flow from the lumen to epithelia and this gradient can be used for co-transporter uh, co to move the glucose from the lumen to inside this cell. But then, how it's transported from the cell to the circulation? Because in, in the uh, whole epi uh, epithelial weave, okay, it just means that okay, we have some kind of mechanism, some kind of black box to move the glucose uh, through this epithelia. And there are four different possibilities to do it. We could have a glucose, active glucose pump that uh, is pumping glucose from the lumen. Or we could pump glucose actively from the epithelial cells to the circulation. Or we could have a glucose channel that is maintaining that okay there is it in inside the epithelial cell and in the circulation there is uh, the same amount of glucose because it's in they're in equilibrium 
and how it's done it's a glue ghost transporter that is uh, it's a uniporter it's not uh, so it's a little bit l slower than this channel but it's uh, a f a binding glue goes and then letting it out for some reason so actually the same thing could have been done several different ways and actually also it's affecting that okay we can have different kind of strategies to absorb the glucose over here we have a, a glucose uptake capacity so how much glucose they can absorb in the circulation and it's differing drastically you can see that it's it's a logarithmic scale so the carnivores that are me eating meat they are very poor in eating any sugar so the glucose in their diet is is n it's not absorbed in the circulation much at all but then the herbivores that are eating vegetables they are much better in this but then what you see in the hummingbird that is drinking the glucose concentrated solutions from the uh, uh, flowers it's uh, enormous uh, poten potential to uh, uh, take all the glucose from the intestine to the circulation so it's several fold higher capacity than uh, any other vertebrates and actually I don't know how it, how it does it but it could be that for example in humans we have 10 different glucose transporters these are the uniporters and they all have difference in the glucose affinity and then we have at least two sodium glucose co-transporter well actually we, we might have five but the uh, three of these i uh, it's not been as uh, evaluated that okay are they really transporting glucose so we can have different kind of proteins to do the same thing and depending on the uh, affinity for the lichen they might be a little bit e uh, better to do the job or a little bit less good in do the, doing the job well let's go in chill epithelia because over there we also have the iron transportation if we ha are living in the pond water or lake or river so in in non-salty uh, waters there there's le less salt outside the fish than inside the cell fish so then the fish lose salt from its body quite easily and the chill epithelia they have active chloride and sodium transportation so we they need energy for maintaining the uh, blood salt and and how did it do it it's actually using the carbon dioxide that is caused from metabolism and binding it to water to get some carbonite and then in the epithelia of this epi uh, of the chills there is a chloride transport and the chloride can be pumped at the same time as the carbonite and then we have active sodium transport that is used to move sodium in one direction and proton in, under, in other directions so it's using pretty much the same thing that we were using in the stomach but now there is also the chloride transportation so that's why we have different kind of transporters and 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 uh, co-transporters so the fish is using all the time atp so to to get the so, uh, lost sodium and chloride 
back in this in in the cells and from that it's very easy to get in this very nice thing that okay what's in isotonic solution you and me we know that okay it's it's on now we are getting on the osmosis so if there is more water outside than inside or, or less less salt in outside than inside then the water is moving either inside the cell or outside the cell and if we have isotonic uh, solution it contains as much salt as we do and in humans or any other animals it's the normal way but then if we would be plants they would wither and in case there is less water the water, water tries to go inside the cell inside the animal and it can be brushed but in the plant where there is a cell wall that's the normal situation because they have have a place to put all the water inside extra water in the in, in, in the in, inside the cell and then if we have hypertonic like in marine uh, environment and the fish now the water is trying to escape from the cell or the animal and it will be shriva and then in the plant cell of course it will be plasmalized because the cell me membrane is then binded or glued in the cell wall and and that's n not a very good thing and okay how this osmosis was working so if we have high concentration and low concentration and semi-permeable uh, uh, membrane then the water will go until there is no concentration difference and this pressure osmotic pressure it depends only on the quantity of these particles so it's moving to lower concentration and because the part of the water is bonded always on soluble uh, particles, ions and molecules, this reduces the concentration of free water. And that's why the uh, water is moving where there is much more anything else except water. And it's a uh, collective pro uh, property. So it doesn't matter if you are full of sodium or potassium or glucose or whatever. And this osmosis has a lot of consequences. First of all, it affects uh, that, okay, more particles you have, the lower freezing point you have. And this was the thing that we saw already in the previous videos where we had these anti-freezing proteins that were lowering the freezing point of the body. It's also affecting that, okay, you have actually higher boiling point but well that's not very biological but it also affects that okay the higher osmotic pressure leads to water accumulation in in aquatic vertebrates especially for fish it's it's a, a problem with okay vertebrates have osmotic pressure that is maybe 300 milliosm meaning that okay it's, it's about 150 milli mole of of some salt containing plus charge and ne um, negative charge positive charge and negative like sodium chloride so that, that, that's why it's, it's about 300 uh, milliosm but then if you are in pond water where the uh, osmotic pressure is much less then water is going to accumulate you and then if the same fish is then transported in the ocean where there is high osmotic pressure now the water is uh, fluxing away from the fish thank you